that at higher doses with artificial estrogen chemicals, you find less of an effect in many cases than at low doses. So a lot of scientists say the dose makes the poison. It's a common phrase you hear as you're training to become a scientist and it's extended out into the culture. The dose makes the poison. And this is sometimes true. For example, if you take a lot of vitamins, they're healthy, but as you increase the dose beyond a certain point, it makes it poisonous. It becomes toxic. It becomes too much for your body to handle. The dose makes the poison. If you take a ton of protein, it becomes toxic. You can't clear all that, uh, all, all that chemical, all the ammonia. Dose makes the poison. You eat too much fat, dose makes poison, all this stuff. But what's interesting with that common phrase is that it's wrong in certain cases. And I wanna talk about those cases. Because when I was interviewing Dr. Michael Skinner, he's an epigenetic scientist, uh, we were discussing this very thing and he had some really interesting things to say about it, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I have a paper here from 2017. It just came out in the Molecular Nutrition Food Research Journal. It's called Combinatory Estrogenic Effects. Combinatory, you have a bunch of them, they act together. Combinatory estrogenic effects between the isoflavone genistein, that's the one in soy, we've talked a lot about that before, that's the estrogen in soy, plant estrogen, and the mycoestrogen, xerolinone and alternariol in vitro. Mycoestrogen, all right? So there's, the title is basically saying, we're studying the combination of soy estrogen and mold estrogen. What happens? Well, they say addition to phytoestrogens, food may also contain mycotoxins with estrogenic properties. So they demonstrate in this paper, the conclusion is, the mixture effects of phyto and mycoestrogens potentially pose unexpected risks to consumers. And one other comment they make at the end in their concluding remarks is the nature of interactions between these soy estrogens and these mold estrogens seemed to depend on the ratio of the substances in the mixture and also on the concentrations applied. But basically, genistein and xerolinone were found, syner they had synergistic effects in these combinations. Synergistic effects, they acted together in concert. And that's something that's totally overlooked in a lot of science. I talk about this in my book, even though this paper wasn't even published when I was writing my book. I talked about the potential for additive effects constantly. I was hammering on that because it's so important because what happens with scientific research is people do studies and they look at one chemical. They look at just soy estrogen, or they look at just mold estrogen, or they look at BPA, or phthalates, or red food coloring, or whatever. The problem is, all of these chemicals are acting in your body on the estrogen receptor, and they're acting in the same way. They're all acting like estrogen. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that researchers find, you know, as you add multiple chemicals, they act in concert. Not only that, in fact, sometimes they even exacerbate the problem, make it even worse than if you just had, you know, a certain do high dose of one or a certain high dose of the other. If you have 50% of the dose and 50% of the dose of two, they can act even higher. It's strange, but that's where my conversation with Dr. Skinner was really interesting because he studies the inheritance of health problems from artificial chemicals. And he was saying the dose makes the poison, this phrase that scientists use, he was saying that's ridiculous. And he, he was talking specifically about his research and get this, he finds that at higher doses with artificial estrogen chemicals, you find less of an effect in many cases than at low doses. And I said, how can that be? That doesn't make any sense. So if you have low doses, you have a stronger effect than if you have high doses. And he says basically what happens is with hormones or chemicals that imitate hormones, your body has receptors and as the dose goes up, your body stops making those receptors. It downregulates the receptors, so you have less of a response. This is similar to testosterone. So if you're injecting testosterone, you know, you have to keep injecting more and more and more because your body blunts the response. You stop making those receptors. It's called downregulation. It's called feedback. It's a feedback loop.
right? And that's what happens with these chemicals. Essentially, you have these chemicals at low doses and they have this huge response, but then as you increase the doses, sometimes that response actually goes down because your body is trying to adapt to that, but obviously that's gonna throw off your natural estrogen response. So that's a huge issue. Dose doesn't make the poison because at low doses you have a worse health problem in a lot of cases and that makes the, that makes the research really confusing. And I mean the other thing about the dose makes the poison that I think is just silly is that you know there's certain chemicals. So again, vitamins, yeah, if you, as you increase the dose eventually they become toxic. There's a lot of things like that. Natural chemicals our bodies have seen, if you have too much of them, they become toxic. With these artificial chemicals, however, your gut bacteria haven't seen them. They don't break a lot of them down. Your, your, you, your body doesn't have enzymes that break a lot of these down. So what happens is, even at tiny, tiny doses, some chemicals break up your DNA. They cut your DNA, for example. Or they cut up the DNA in your mitochondria, for example. Those, there's no such thing as a good dose of that stuff. If you have a chemical that's destroying DNA, that's not gonna be a, there's no such thing as a safe concentration, you see? So the dose doesn't make the poison. Any amount of some of those chemicals is bad. And I think that's true of artificial estrogen. There's really no dose that you want to expose your body to. And that's why I would prefer to see these things made illegal. We don't really need BPA. There's plenty of other healthier plastics, and I, sh I shouldn't say healthy, but you know what I mean. There's alternatives. So we don't really need phthalates, you know, so we should be making these illegal. But a lot of times I'm getting asked, well, how much is okay? How much can I drink out of this plastic, number one? You know, all these kind of questions. How much exposure should I have? Well, honestly, just minimize your exposure. Don't go insane. You know, don't become a hypochondriac to constantly obsessing over this. Just minimize the exposure the best you can. Be especially cautious with children and infants and pregnant mothers, but recognize the dose doesn't make the poison. That's false.